So Natalie, that I know uh, for many years now, she is an advisor at Israel since 2019. She has been participating in the college institutions for 20 years now. She as a uh, pedagogical counselor, as a guidance counselor uh, with regards to uh, uh, digital education. She's interested in the organizational process for uh, development related to intelli uh, collective intelligence and practice communities. Project manager at Réseau Réactif, Marco Yelbo, is in the college network as uh, works as a guidance counselor, teaches philosophy, and member of research ethics committees in many CGFs in Quebec. He has the QIPC college certification and member of the leader network. David Mako is interested in the questions related to facilitation and access to education by digital tools. So I wish you a wonderful webinar, ladies and gentlemen, and I uh, will see you shortly. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. We are not uh, used to being introduced in this way. Mako and I, being very humble, informal uh, people, uh, we uh, are people, people, if you will, and uh, it's um, nonetheless nice to be introduced formally in this way. So thank you to all of you. Thank you to uh, the people who are here with us today and who will watch the video. We are present today to share with you one of the resources, one of the significant resources in the community of practice on Hizo Optic. I will share my screen. And uh, yes. So uh, we are here today to introduce, to give you a guided tour, if you will, of uh, this guide called JA. It's a giant and tentacular uh, tool. That's why we adopted uh, this uh, acronym. How did JA start? Well, JA, um, in 2019, since I began, uh, after I took over from Nicole, uh, as host of Israel Think, that has uh, 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 all the different guidance counselors and for digital tools in different colleges. And so the policy that has been uh, around for a while, and somebody came to see me and said, together, we should uh, have a guide, build a guide on evaluating uh, learning using digital tools, whether it be online or in the classroom with digital tools. I don't know how we can do that, but we started with a collaborative workshop. And that was. Uh, in November 2019, less than six months later, that also coincides with, you know what, in 2020. So six months after I began my position, we took a break and we launched into practical knowledge on evaluating uh, learning or pedagogy using digital tools because we were in a remote uh, learning situation. and. Uh, for pedagogical learning and uh, educational activities. When we came back to the classroom, we started a project group on evaluating learning with digital tools and thinking about what would be the best way to mutualize and share the knowledge to uh, put them into a resource that would really serve as a tool to educational professionals. So parallel to that, there's collect, there's a Connecto by Educative uh, Agreement that you probably already know. You may be uh, a member or receive the newsletter or read the, their articles. They had a project to host a frame of reference, a reference document, if you will. Edictif uh, already hosts the Kofiltik and the Gidget uh, uh, sites. We will uh, mention that later on in the presentation. They had uh, as a mandate in their service agreement to uh, have a guide on evaluating uh, education or ped uh, pedagogy uh, learning. So uh, we joined our efforts together and uh, they became the host of this guide and the author is Julie Leroux, Julie Leroux with a group uh, uh, dedicated to this project under Réseau Reptique. And it was all launched uh, a year later 
and we are now a year after that, and we're here to present that. So the presentation today is really a guided tour. There are three main parts. There's a central pillar or a central part where there are six sub uh, pillars where we will uh, cover all of this and vis visit all of the different parts. And so this way you will have a better idea to how to navigate through the resource. And the idea is not to learn it all by heart, but to understand the structure. So I'm going to stop my uh, screen share. I will launch. I'm just going to see if I haven't forgotten anything. But I think that the only thing I had to say really is uh, Julie Leroux that you uh, saw on screen is the author of the guide. She doesn't need introduction, uh, in my opinion, because she wrote uh, some uh, uh, books that were published on the uh, digital tools uh, in education. She's a retired uh, teacher at Université de Jabrook, and she is uh, a, a pedagogy uh, teacher, so she's really an expert in evaluating learning. And she, that's why uh, she's very well known professionally, and she has a, a very a strong legacy, and it was a good uh, experience, great to collaborate with her. So this is the link that's in the chat for Jean. So before handing it over to Marco, who will introduce uh, the structure of uh, this tour or guide. Thank you, Nathalie. So Jean, it was uh, a long winded uh, work with Julien, uh, with Julien and the uh, EPTEC to adopt the uh, and adapt this to the college uh, institutional and uh, the network. And so well, this is our strength. We understand what, you, uh, what you're going through in, at the college uh, level at CEGEPS. And so you can see here on the screen, you can go through Eductive or you can just search uh, again GEA. And so there's a menu here uh, with three lines that you can open up and see the accompanying guides, the guides, uh, the tick profile and the cap and GEA. So it's another way to discover the GEA guide. So you will right away have a quick overview, the ideas, the structure on the front page there. And uh, then we're gonna get into how to navigate this tool. It's separated into three main parts. The frames of reference to really drill down on these uh, notions, the process that uh, Nathalie will present, which is very interesting, and the models to integrate uh, digital tools. So we present three models, uh, TPAC and uh, RAT and uh, Big RAT, that the models we use to, to construct the guide. So if you want to get into more detail, how to integrate uh, these tools into uh, learning activities, uh, I uh, would invite you to go to see the CAP guide, which is exclusively around this question of what steps you must follow to integrate digital tools uh, in education. What are the thresholds? Why do I, how do I do it? It's a great guide that uh, will really allow you to have a good idea to uh, get to know EPTIC and get deeper onto these questions. So this is the, you can, you know, I will talk about the frames of reference. Often we go through this uh, uh, very quickly and we don't go into detail. We're uh, excited to get into the crux of things, but this is an important introduction and to understand uh, the frame of reference. So this section brings us right away into um, a section that uh, contains uh, Questions, questions that are a starting point. That's what I uh, think uh, is a great way to start, to start uh, with this, uh, these questions around uh, different skills and aspects of uh, uh, this tool. These are the main questions, uh, frequently asked questions when you talk about the approach and program. What are the questions I must ask in my evaluation? You go from a high level view, a macro view, to a really detailed micro view of specifically uh, step by step. So uh, this is uh, presented uh, all of these questions. So these 
questions, you'll see in, in uh, the questions, the part, there's a guide and there are, are one pagers that uh, have all these elements. Uh, so quick reference guide that, that you can uh, uh, then uh, use as a tool. You can follow and use the tables and fill them out. There's a, a diagnostic tool that uh, there was some great work uh, done by guidance counselors, uh, uh, possibly some in your institution who have uh, worked on this to make this wealth of information available, uh, easy to digest uh, and navigate. So it's separated into different dimensions, 11 different dimensions. We will go one to the other. What questions I will ask. So the program approach is from 93. It's not new, but it's complicated. Um, it's important to see where our foundations lie, where we started, why we are working in this way and how we plan our evaluations uh, in a program-based approach. So there's a model here that's presented, but the structure here is a very general one, the program of study, there's a program committee, uh, the uh, guidance, the plans, the uh, uh, frame of reference for uh, plans, the uh, SP, uh, well, courses, plans, the course plans, and uh, the evaluation of the uh, system and programs. So there's all these main uh, questions, these macro questions that are explained in this uh, section. Of course, these are not questions we necessarily ask at the outset because you have to adapt the, the course plan and give uh, adapt the courses and uh, prepare all of that and so you have to talk to your program committee in our department who've done all this work uh we, we want to integrate into that and follow along it's important to look at the structure and the framework uh of uh, what we used to do our work in the classroom every day that's right we begin with this section then um, we drill down, we go to level two. Then I have an evaluation, knowledge and uh, skills, a, a skill-based approach. It's been uh, around for a long time. If you're like me, I'm between both. I was starting out when it began, this uh, skill-based approach, but uh, you can't teach philosophy in a skill-based approach. You uh, uh, teach philosophy with a traditional approach based on a knowledge, knowledge based not a skill based approach. So it's, you have to go around your story bites to see the decision of what the skill based approach means and how it applies, what the ramifications are, why it is different than what I've probably uh, seen in my native discipline. So there's an explanation here, really uh, detailed and uh, well synthesized the skill based approach, which is a uh, model in Géant that explains in detail what the uh, what knowledge is and how to be, how to act and all of that. And it's also a macro element, a high level view element, but it's a very important uh, one. What are the mainline elements when we begin planning our class? Uh, what does the skill uh, based uh, planning mean and how do I deploy that? The third level context, uh, what do, how do I do this? And we talk about asynchronous, synchronous modalities. We've probably seen this with the pandemic. It's probably a more well known now, but it's interesting to ask the question, synchronous or asynchronous, uh, uh, real time or not. So at a practical level, the weighting, what does it mean? But the different weight and different macro elements that structure our evaluation and our class. Then that uh, brings us to step four, which is the intention of the evaluation. Why do I evaluate? Then you drill down into that, you get it more into planning and courses. And I look at my uh, my course, my uh, semester, and how many weeks, depending. And uh, then I want to evaluate things. What do I want to evaluate? When? How do I distribute all of this? Is it a diagnostic or my training evaluation, certificate evaluation? What kind of evaluation do I want to do? And how do I want to posture myself? How do I want to control? Do I want to uh, be there to control all of it? Do I want it to be a team-based thing? Or, or homework, uh, how do I want to do that? So it's all these questions that I have to ask. What kind of evaluation do, wanna, uh, do I want to use or when? And how do I spread it out throughout my semester? It's still a micro level view, 
but uh, you're getting more into a calendar kind of thinking. So what's really interesting is the objective. Why am I doing this and when? When is it optimal to uh, undertake these actions, uh, these evaluations? So I'm going to, we have to look at that when you start planning your uh, class. So uh, we uh, talk about training-based evaluations and training evaluation, uh, I want, it's very important. So what is a formative evaluation? What, are, what, uh, what is it in detail? What uh, will the student do exactly? So we have here a list of the types of formative evaluations, a description, general description, and digital tools that can help us to conduct these formative evaluations. So we have lots of ideas here in this section on how to integrate digital tools in formative evaluations. Step six, the uh, certificate of uh, certification evaluation. We still have this, these instructions on how to do it step by step. There's a section here on pedagogical practices uh, to uh, use um, and to, to privilege intellectual integrity and to uh, stop the cheating and plagiarism. Uh, we cover that in this section very quickly. Uh, we update our guide on intellectual integrity and ethics and the collaboration with Rivik and uh, the uh, librarian uh, network. So it's for us, uh, uh, it's for all of us. It should be published soon at the end of the semester to uh, um, talk about uh, AI and how we, we have to be careful of these issues and keep an open eye and open mind on uh, these uh, things. We will publish that and update it soon. The guide is available presently but we will update it uh, considering artificial intelligence. It will be available soon. So for um, we've done our evaluations, what type of evaluations we want to do? Why do we do these evaluations? How do we weight them? Then we get into feedback. So uh, that's another part where we can use this for evaluation and for learning. As a, students uh, always want to evaluate their teachers. I, I didn't always do that, but uh, I uh, wish that I had. It's very important. It's an opportunity uh, for learning and it's a teaching uh, opportunity as well. So it's a, a great uh, description of the different forms of feedback, synchronous, asynchronous, uh, in real time or not, different uh, apps and tools you can use, uh, group evaluations and a lot of uh, things to uh, present here. So the right conditions for feedback, and it's often an aspect that the digital tools can help us with. So uh, don't uh, skip over this section. It's really worth uh, your time. Even if everything is going well, why would I lose points on this and that? You probably received some questions. And uh, so you have to, uh, it's a normal thing. Even if there's not a lot of students who come and give you uh, direct feedback and ask you questions, it's worth uh, understanding uh, uh, feedback and. Uh, mechanisms and tools so so the tasks and methods for evaluation that's uh, where um, my favorite tool uh, table uh, advantages or disadvantages with regards to different types of evaluation so this is very detailed uh, with uh, an accent on digital tools but it can apply in situations that don't use digital tools um, it, uh, it Lynn is an expert of eva on evaluation we solicited her help for the digital part, but uh, it transcends that. So it's really a good uh, understanding and overview of uh, advantages or disadvantages of different types of evaluation, even if it's uh, not written specifically for uh, digital, but it transcends and it includes that. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Can you make sure, because of uh, simultaneous translation of English, can you make sure? that everything is well heard by the interpreter. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck to the interpreter. Uh, I have a thick accent. Um, yes, so a table uh, describing advantages and disadvantages, which that's very interesting in this section, which is uh, a very uh, uh, interesting and uh, wealth of information in this section. Uh, step nine, um, tools for evaluation. We are into the details now. What do we do exactly? What are the advantages, disadvantages? 
And now we are into the fine details. What are the instruments and tools that we use for evaluation? So that's where we present three uh, tools, instruments for uh, means for evaluation, uh, exam, portfolio, and evaluation uh, tables. So I will show you the digital portfolio because it's something I like, uh, very interesting. Um, so the digital portfolio, especially in the context of the arrival of AI, um, the digital portfolio uh, uh, allows us to uh, follow along and not just evaluate the final product, but follow the progression and uh, all the things that were worked on by the students. So it's a very interesting uh, means of evaluation, very detailed, and uh, you can follow the progression and how things evolved uh, and how um, it's a wonderful section on the digital portfolio. If you're curious uh, um, to use this uh, evaluation method in your class, the digital portfolio, uh, maybe for your whole class or part of your class, uh, you should go see this uh, section uh, to help you do that. For digital uh, tools, there's a presentation, a basic overview. Uh, when you have a good idea of using a tool that we uh, like or find very interesting, always come back to the basics. Does it fit my pedagogical alignment or plans? And uh, uh, can uh, you can uh, talk to a guidance counselor or a technical uh, pedagogical expert to uh, answer these questions if you're not sure. We have a presentation here of some tools and uh, uh, different types of tools. Uh, for example, uh, as all things, different apps uh, in the digital world, they, they evolve very quickly. This section will no longer be up to date uh, in a few months. That's the challenge of uh, keeping this up to date with the different apps and tools. and. Uh, things evolve very quickly and we have to keep uh, updating it and mapping it. So that's why I encourage you to go and meet uh, your IT people, your uh, CEGEP, we have tech, we work and updating uh, digital tools constantly and uh, tools that are available in apps that you can use that can help you last tick, last uh, kick, if it's available in your CEGEP and if it uh, uh, follows the standards for uh, cybersecurity in your CEGEP. So, your uh, CPTIC will be able to accompany you in this uh, uh, process. It's different for every institution, depending on uh, your stage or college. So it's a good starting point to see the different tools and apps and what exists, but uh, it doesn't uh, replace uh, REPTIC. And the last step, step 11, is interaction. So everything around it's a, a funnel, uh, everything the student does, interaction with contact, with you and teacher, uh, with guidance counselors and interaction between the students themselves. So how it can be facilitated by digital tools, uh, how to use tools to manage that and answer questions around that in the classroom, what it would look like. So there you go. That was uh, uh, short and uh, sweet. I hope you were able to follow along. This is a guide that is a funnel a model from macro to micro, from general concepts to uh, details. And now I will hand it over to uh, my colleague who will cover the process. Thank you, Marco. It's now my turn to share my screen. So I will give the opportunity to the participants to take a little a break because it was a very uh, fast 15 minutes and uh, uh, well uh, managed. Uh, thank you, Marco. So Marco introduced uh, the section on the right, the models to integrate digital tools. The left part, which is the frame of reference, the reference guide, if you will, the uh, chat, you can see that. Uh, it can be used uh, for guidance counselors for personal uh, guidance for teachers. There's some uh, guide. There's some guides on how to do that. The JL and uh, how you can use the tools for uh, learning. So I uh, evaluate learning. My my part is the central part. Who will describe the process of evaluation with digital tools? So in thinking with Julie Genreau, 
the intention and the intention of uh, the uh, illustration that came out of the thinking that our thinking and the, we see this as a process from the beginning to the end but at the same time we know that there's the theory and there's practice and practice in real life we can get into the process not necessarily in the beginning we can come in at the end or that's why there are arrows on both directions. You can come in uh, to the process at step three or step six. You don't have to begin on step one. The, the step one would be if you put together a, a program of study in pharmacy, for example, pharmacology, you start with nothing. You start with a, a profession guy, a profile, then you go from step one to step six to build your uh, program of study. But for the Teachers who are listening, you already have that. You already do evaluation. You already have a program of study. So sometimes it's not necessarily to reinvent the wheel and start with number one. Sometimes you uh, say, okay, I've uh, done my spring cleaning and evaluating uh, uh, my students and I will come back to step one. So is it relevant for everything? Maybe not, but it was necessary. It's like uh, a rigorous process uh, that is necessary to set up the process. You can use it sequentially or um, to uh, get into it uh, um, somewhere mid uh, midway, so uh, mid process. So I um, not go. Uh, had his part that was interesting for him, but I'm very uh, anxious for people to be able to click on this and uh, go to this next section here. So we have the uh, context around the process that explains everything. I'm just going to scroll down here because what's interesting for me is the six main steps. I will describe the six steps and try to um, ask questions. What kind of questions come out of each step? So I begin first with anal analysis. So typically, you can consult this part of the guide when you are building a program of study, a program that doesn't exist yet, and you have to, in two years, be able to start with some students. That's the classic way to do it, but not necessarily, because you can analyze during program revision or revising a program of study, or you can uh, maybe for many years do things a certain way and then say, well, is this in accordance with the original plan, what I'm doing? If I have this idea for a tool for evaluating, uh, can I uh, use this or that tool and remain uh, in accordance with my original uh, uh, plan? So first, there are two questions. One on the uh, target, what we are trying to learn, and second on the context. So we have uh, guidance counselors and teachers with us. Sometimes there's terminology that is uh, worth looking at that can be confusing so if the if you trip up on terminology just uh, look at the questions the questions are fundamental questions the uh, guiding questions that you ask and even if you don't like uh, the learning target or the learning objectives everybody asks these questions what is the skill level or what are these skills that we want to develop in the classroom what it will I do to help my students to uh, learn and uh, uh, pick up these skills. So what activities will uh, we conduct in order to do this? So there's a, a guide here that you can download, a quick uh, read, a uh, quick uh, start guide. If you uh, have a group uh, process to build a program or as a department or as a group, if uh, you want to build a program study, for example, as a group, you can have a guided uh, whiteboarding or uh, think guided thinking, or it can be uh, individual thinking uh, as uh, a well brainstorming. So we can talk about the context in one of the uh, uh, files of the frame of reference to analyze. Is my program completely online or am I doing a bimodal education? Uh, or in the normal classroom, we call that uh, uh, enriched, uh, Presence-based education. We call that presence in French. 
So uh, in class education with uh, digital tools to enrich uh, the traditional learning model in the classroom. So we are in 2024 now. We, um, especially after the pandemic, there's not a lot of classrooms where you really have the old tools and students uh, do paper-based evaluation and learning. So it's digital tools. Of, uh, we still have some places where there aren't any, but uh, mostly uh, digital tools. So uh, I see teachers um, in technical disciplines, uh, they will use uh, digital tools in their profession in many cases. So like uh, educational technicians, for example, for early childhood education, early childhood education technicians and uh, daycare uh, centers or uh, uh, and they will use digital tools to get feedback uh, or give feedback uh, on the uh, children uh, and the parents and they will use that in their profession and in uh, their program of study as well. So we have this um, um, quick uh, start uh, uh, guide, this uh, one page guide and to plan, um, step two is to planning, uh, is planning the course plan what are we going to include in our class so that the teacher so that we can evaluate what they've learned what are the tasks that the teachers uh the students will use and what, what are we uh, oral presentation and simulation and exam and also planning is also the moment in time when do we do evaluations is there a specific period of time during the semester will the students evaluate themselves will it be the teacher that will obviously, uh, we will uh, see that there's uh, a uh, inflection point on how we're going to evaluate, how we're going to correct uh, things. Uh, to, uh, so the uh, second step is how to plan all of that through my 15 weeks or another type of college calendar, how I'm going to uh, plan all of this. I have to also consult the PIA because there are rules to plan my evaluation. So, there are uh, many downloadable guides to keep track of all of that, the how, the why, uh, the when, and there are uh, uh, downloadable one-page guides that you can use for that. I will scroll down and we can go to step three, which is to design. Now that I've planned what I wanna do over 15 weeks, well, I have to design the tasks and the instruments, the tools for evaluation. I have to specify what I'm going to have them do and how I will look at their work and evaluate. Um, so uh, design um, evaluation activities. Uh, so I guess I have to uh, put together an exam. I have to put together instructions. There's, uh, this is the micro level. These students will see very clearly at the planning step, the student sees uh, also because the, he sees it in the course plan what uh, we will do during this uh, semester. But at the design uh, step, they will really see and read the instructions related to projects and homework and exams. I'm asked the question, what I will ask of my student and how will the task be presented? Then what I will look at, what I will examine, uh, what are the criteria for evaluation and what digital tools I will ask the students to use. Then I also ask the question, has the student learned to use these digital tools? Does he have sufficient mastery of these tools? Does he have the digital skills necessary to master these tools? We have in this step many uh, formats, many examples to ask questions. Uh, uh, for a complex task, uh, so to uh, evaluate skills, it's a complex uh, task. So an example of a criteria evaluation, to determine criteria evaluation, our evaluation table, what I'm looking for and what the student is doing. There's a component of a different parts of the task and what the student is uh, doing, and there's a, a certain amount of quality we're looking for. So how will I establish a criteria for evaluation that will ensure the validity of evaluation and look at quality. Am I really evaluating what I want to evaluate? 
We're also asking questions uh, around self-evaluation, co-evaluation, possibly evaluation by peers. That's at the design step. We also see it at the planning step because we think it's a macro uh, part of it. And at the design step, well, concretely, uh, will I do peer evaluation first and then I will evaluate uh, following that? So a very micro, uh, sequential uh, evaluation. So this is at the design uh, part. So I will uh, not scroll down and rather I will go back to the top here and I will go this way. So there's two ways of doing the same thing. So at this step, at step four, we want to uh, cast a judgment, to judge things, to correct and interpret. These students have accomplished the task we've asked them to do. And typically, um, we use this when we plan, uh, when we want to correct. So correction is part of our uh, job, but the practice has evolved uh, since uh, when you sit down with a red pen, a coffee, and uh, correct by hand. Of course, there are people who do that still, but there's a variety of ways to correct uh, students work to examine to judge if the task has been accomplished correctly or not uh, at what level and what quality so we're talking about uh, correction with digital tools sometimes it's automation of correction and feedback in certain cases so we can say yes i have to set up my exam in moodle if we use this digital tool uh, to uh, uh, correct uh, the students work. So we also talk about correction with digital tools. You can talk about, think about audio correction or a stylus, or you, you receive copies on the computer and annotate the copies. So it's also that part of it to ju cast judgment and uh, to uh, make a judgment to be as effective as possible. We want to give feedback of the best quality possible to the students, but without necessarily adding to their task disproportionately, especially if we have students like Marco who don't read the comments of their teacher. But the remains that there is an impact of an excellent uh, feedback uh, system on uh, teaching and uh, the success of students. We uh, don't need to prove that anymore. It's clear that feedback is a factor of success that is very important. We also have a question here on interpreting uh, uh, an objective or subjective in evaluating the, so to uh, for example uh, go around certain myths so like a bell curve if I grade on a curve if it, my exam is good if five uh, students fail for example so um, there's myths that are uh, persistent and uh, I'm probably in preaching to the choir here but people uh, like you who are interested in evaluation are probably uh, already have uh, uh, been through these uh, myths. But uh, we're uh, on a step five of six now. So for this one, I will go down to the bottom here and go to step five, decision. So now that we've corrected, we have to give a grade or a mark. So usually we can uh, publish this when you publish the grades on Omnibox or on CallNet. When you publish uh, grades or look at payas, you verify how much time do I have to correct to correct two weeks? I have two weeks. I plan my time. Will I be able to do it? Can I uh, start the other project while I'm correcting and uh, produce uh, the notes for the next project? So this is a decision part. So these questions allow us to think really with intention about communicating the results and feedback following evaluation and the impact it will have on the student to receive this feedback to always uh, be uh, a tool for learning. So the answer to this question will be different depending on the evaluation. If it's a diagnostic evaluation, a formative evaluation, or a uh, summative evaluation. So I'll come back to the last uh, step, which is uh, the one People go over too quickly sometimes because well, it's very important, however, the validation step is to uh, reflective practice, really. So typically, 
you can consult this part of the guide once we've made changes to an instrument for evaluation or uh, evaluation modality, or when you're uh, wondering, uh, have some questions. And I like to say as a joke, when do we have time to do that after the uh, call of uh, the AQPC conference before the vacation? Uh, what I would like to change for this or that class, and uh, that's uh, where we do uh, uh, thinking and uh, analyzing the uh, errors of the, of the students to adjust our strategy for teaching and evaluation. It's a way of doing it. We also have here a uh, guide with questions to orient the validation of the evaluation process and evaluating learning and ask the question, what am I looking at? What is my student doing? And what am I asking him to do? Will that allow him to learn? Because ultimately, that's uh, why we are here. We are here to make sure the students learn and evaluate the things they've learned that serve uh, the process of education. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. I presented the process and Marco presented the uh, model for evaluation of the frame of reference. We saw the three main components of the guide at 12.15. I will now hand it over to Marco uh, for the conclusion, quick conclusion. Thank you to all the Reptic who participated in this guide and Jin Wu, who really has a great a legacy and all the experience that, uh, uh, wealth of experience that she has that we used uh, to uh, uh, adapt all of this. and. Uh, uh, in question form, each question has a uh, uh, section has questions and uh, reference files uh, and tools to use. If the vocabulary is too general, drill down. There are questions that apply directly to you. Uh, uh, frequently asked questions and important questions for evaluation. So it's uh, really a two part uh, process uh, and it goes very much into detail and very uh, much drilling down uh, with the questions on the different reference files to be able to uh, uh, master all of these uh, tools. Thank you uh, to all the Epsics, Genevu, and Marie, and Joseph, and all the people who work on this. There's a Epsic in your college who has contributed to this guide. So don't be shy to go and speak with this person. Uh, about this guide, they're, that's what they're there for. The, the, the people will be happy to speak with you. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Marco. Give us a very great overview of the Jean guide. It was very good. And as you were saying, you can uh, learn it uh, and use it in a linear way. And you can also consult the different sections at different times for different reasons. So it's also non sequential. So you can go through the different parts and different steps, and you can go and explore and Peel the onion, if you will, and explore the different parts of it. So thank you to both of you. Thank you uh, again. And I will say we will see you soon. And I hope uh, to meet you in person at the uh, QPC conference in uh, June and get to know you and all the stuff. So we say goodbye, everybody, and we will see you uh, soon. Thank you.